Hello. Oh. <laughs> well, um, good evening, middag. Did I say that correct? <laughs> I don't know if you can tell I'm, I'm not from here. I'm not Swedish. Um, actually, I'm actually all over the map. Um, I was born in Hong Kong. I grew up in Macau. Um, I went to the U.S. to study. Um, and then, you know, once I was in the U.S., I came from a very traditional Chinese family. And uh, in, in Chinese family, we were allowed to have three professions. We can either be a lawyer, we can be an investment banker, <laughs> uh, and the third thing is we can be a doctor. I chose to study uh, medicine except that I wasn't very good at it. In fact, uh, when I was studying in the US, you could take this test called the MCAT, and I scored the um, bottom 3%. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work. So um, I decided, I told my mom, um, I want to start uh, studying architecture. And my mom said, no, you're not. <laughs> It's not within those, those three things. You, you, you can't study architecture. And she said to me, well, you can study architecture if you get into Harvard. I was like, OK. <laughs> so I studied very hard, and somehow, magically, I landed uh, at Harvard, and I studied architecture there. Great, right? Um, and then I decided that I didn't want to continue architecture anymore. <laughs> and went on a backpacking trip for six months in South America trying to find answers to my life. Um, and there I met a boy. There's always a boy in the story. Um, sorry, Mark, my boyfriend, who's right there. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, I landed in Barcelona, where I have been living for the last 18 years. Right? So Barcelona, how many of you guys have been to Barcelona? A wonderful city, right? Yes. Yes? No. Yes. <laughs> Well, I love Barcelona, except that when I arrived to Barcelona, um, I felt a little bit like this, um, because I didn't speak the language, I didn't know anyone, I couldn't get a job, no one would hire me, my title, my diploma uh, wouldn't, weren't accepted in, in Spain, so I felt complete, like someone had just chopped off my arms, I was useless in Spain. So, um, you know, I was um, coming out of university, so I didn't know what to do, I was somewhat bored, and what do you do when you're bored? You have kids. <laughs> I love my kids. Don't get me wrong, I hope they're not watching. <laughs> I love my kids very much. Um, I never expected to you know, be a housewife. Um, I, and and this, this man here is actually a wonderful person as well. <laughs> um, except that you know, he saw that I was bored and he said, uh, for one day for Christmas, how you know, appropriate given the time of the year, uh, he gave me one of these. <clears throat> He gave me one of these, and I was like, okay, what am I going to do with, uh, 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 I think it's a sewing machine. Um, but it was just sitting there, and I said, why not? So I tried to use it. So how many of you guys in the audience have used a sewing machine before? Wow! That's amazing! Usually when I ask this question, there are like two you know, person raised their hands. So you guys know what I'm talking about, right? When you press on that pedal, and it makes this like perfect straight line, and it's perfectly spaced, and it goes tak tak tak. It's super satisfying, right? Am I right? Yes, yes, right. Okay, so <laughs> that was my first time ever. I put two pieces of cloth together, and the straight line, and, and, and it's sewed together, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. Do people know about this? This is like superpower. <laughs> So from then on, I realized every single time I make, I increase just a little bit of self-confidence in me. I was like, oh my god, people need to know more about this. So I said, well, what if I, I put a, a, all these people together in the same place, and we can mix stuff together? And that's when I started uh, Makers of Barcelona. And that was uh, eight, nine years ago, and it had grown substantially, and we're the, one of the biggest maker community in Barcelona. I'm pretty proud of it. Okay, so, <laughs> um, but being a maker, uh, I didn't want to end there, right? So what we did next was um, I went to Japan and uh, I found out this, this thing called Fab Cafe. Um, and it was really cool because I, I went in there and I saw these little kids, nine, eight, nine-year-old kid having a birthday party. And they were on their iPad drawing on their own. And I said, God, kids these days, you know, they're in a birthday party. Why are they drawing on iPads? Well, I realized that they were drawing on iPads so that they take their drawings into laser cutters and they would etch the drawings into cookies so that they each have a personalized cookies for the birthday celebration. I was like, boom, 
wow, mind blown. So I wanted to bring that to Barcelona, which I did uh, when I opened Fab Cafe. And it was amazing. So uh, now we have about 11 uh, sister operations all over uh, the world, from Tokyo to Bangkok, Mo Monterey to Toulouse. Um, we're really happy with this community. And, uh, and we keep growing. So one day, we went to a tech conference together um, with some of my colleagues. And I was really frustrated. It was a tech conference, and there were 25 speakers. And out of those 25 speakers, there was only one woman speaking. One out of 25. And I said, there's something wrong with the system. Why are there so few women in the tech community? And so from then on, I said to my colleagues, why don't we build a training camp that teaches women tech, especially AI, so that we can funnel these women into companies and into startups. And that's what we did. We opened All Women, uh, uh, which is an AI training uh, for women by women. And uh, we have trained uh, 50 women last year. And it was our first year, so we're really excited. And we're already. Um, putting these women into companies, so it's already working, so really happy about that. So one of the things that um, became apparent to me in all of this tra entrepreneurial trajectory is that there's a shift in power that is happening. And so the first thing that I've noticed is that not, and all of you guys know, is this access of knowledge, knowledge right? So the other day I just you know, quickly looked up, how do you build a fusion reactor? I don't know what a fusion reactor is, but you can build one at home on seven steps or eight steps um, with, you know, very conveniently at your own home. Um, if you guys ever figure out what a fusion reactor is, please let me know. Or maybe I can just Google, right? <laughs> um, funding also now is making it much more accessible, right? We have platforms like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, that if you have a good idea, you can, put, uh, you can, you can raise funds and you can get your ideas built. Um, we also start seeing that technology is very low cost, right? Uh, a lot of you guys probably have already seen 3D printers uh, being on sale for like 200 and 300 euros. Have you all also noticed that there, you can buy a, um, a DNA, full DNA lab um, where you can do sequencing at your very own home for about $1,000? Right. And the last thing is that we already know this. Communication had been really easy and accessible for us. You can put things on YouTube, Facebook, and so on and so forth. We had talked about it excessively in the, in the last two days. What I have noticed is that because of all these access to these different resources, for the first time in human history, individuals, people, communities have the same innovation power as companies and even nation states. And that's the first thing that I've noticed in this changes of the last you know, 50 years. And that is really empowering. People are capable to do what company used to do, and companies are capable of doing what the government used to do. And I thought, wow, this is pretty extraordinary. We're living in a time where all of our innovation power has been bumped up. Now, the question is, is it necessarily, do we really want companies to have the same innovation power as governments. So in 2017, I had this amazing opportunity to spend three months at Singularity University. And some of you guys, I think, uh, attended the session yesterday from Singularity University, um, the Nordic branch. So, but this was a really special time for me. I spent three months there with 90 really extraordinary participants, uh, and we focused on how to apply technologies on climate change. And from that, when, when I finished the course, I said to myself, I just want to spend the rest of my life working on this topic, which is on uh, sustainability and responsible consumption. So I got really lucky. Uh, much um, Only a couple months later, I landed this job uh, at Alpha, and Alpha is a division at Telephone. Um, and there I'm a social technologist. Do you guys know what a social technologist is? Yes? No? No one. No one had heard of this term. Okay. Yeah, of course, because I invented it. <laughs> um, this job didn't exist. I kind of sort of just, you know, made my way because I wanted the company to know how important it is to be able to solve global challenges with technological solutions. And I presented myself as a candidate, and they accepted. So as a social technologist, this is exactly what I do. I find the intersections between technologies and the challenges that need to be solved. I'm also a future synthesis, meaning that I postulate for desirable futures and reverse engineer those futures so that we can build the roadmap and to implement those things. Uh, and I do that for Telefon Alpha Telefonica. 
So um, for the rest of the talk, I want to walk you through what I do as a social technologist and as a future synthesis in a very specific topic uh, of what we're calling the autonomous commerce. So in order to do that, I'm going to take you back in time. I'm going to share with you guys this notion of what I'm calling the social train. Okay? So the social train goes something like this. Um, sorry, my dress is falling off. <laughs> Because the mic is hanging on my back. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to, you know, be inappropriate here on stage. Okay, so the social train goes something like this. We go to school, get good grades, so that we go to good universities, so that you can get good grades, so that you can get a good job, you can get paid, you can get your salary, buy the house, have the kids, have the picket fence, and you lived happily ever after. Now, who has been on this train? Everyone who has put their kids on this train nowadays. Yes, we all have. Um, this train worked very well in the beginning of the century. It, it created prosperity across the board. But this train isn't working anymore. Why? Because we're going to school to learn skills that are probably going to be obsolete. To go to university, same thing, to learn skills, again, being obsolete. To get a job that well, we probably hate. To marry the person oh, we're probably going to get a divorce with and then buy that house and buy the things that we don't need. So what is happening here, right? This social train created this kind of modern society that relies on convenience. And we have created a lifestyle of fast food, fast fashion. You know, it's just a very fast, convenient lives that we are just you know, moving past on a daily basis. And this is all causing a very fast death onto uh, you know, our planet. I've also noticed that in this fast train, we manage somehow to leave some people behind. Um, we, there are a lot of people in this world that have no food security on one spectrum, and yet on the other spectrum, we're wasting a third of our food, and we have a problem with obesity. How is this possible in this world that we're living? We have two spectrums of the, the, of the same problem, and that for me is very uh, problematic. So um, I want to talk to you guys about this concept of pace layering. Have you guys heard of pace layer? OK, so um, in 1999, Stuart Brandt, in his book called The Book of the Long Now, talked about pace layered, where he borrowed from Frank Duffy. And the pace layering is a framework that I use to understand uh, the change of uh, pace of things, right? So on the very bottom, you have nature. It's very slow, obviously, because evolution is slow, right? Um, then as you move up, you have culture, which means tradition, religion, rituals, and then you move up another layer, you have government, so you have those political institutions uh, that are protecting our culture, our families, um, and our, us as individuals. And then on, that, on top of that, you have infrastructure, and there the, are the roads and buildings and common assets that we use to, to move some of these, um, these um, uh, assets around. And then you have commerce above that, uh, so the commerce use infrastructure, to, to move these services and, 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 and uh, to share these common benefits. And then on top of the, the very top layer is fashion. Fashion as in things that you change every single day. And they, they're um, a kind of um, um, uh, s uh, showing what, how the, the so society has been prospering. So that's kind of sort of the concept of pace layer. Notice that this was made in 1999, right? So, um, each of the layers operate with their own logic and their own order. The, the layers are connected. The, the upper layers are providing innovations because they're moving in a much faster pace. On the bottommost layers, uh, those are the layers that are providing for stability. And together, all of these layers create a kind of resiliency across the board for our society and our civilization. Now, I mentioned that this book was built in 1999. What's actually happened today? Uh, what we're noticing is that there's a disruption at a lot of these layers, right? So nature has been bumped up, um, bumped up because we notice that climate change is changing in a much faster pace that we have never expected before. Governance has been bumped down. Governance is becoming more and more obsolete and, and I would even say paralyzed uh, in today's world. And then you see technologies and commerce moving in a, space, uh, in a pace much faster than we have ever imagined. So all of the layers have been disrupted and now resiliency is being questioned. And one of the things that I've, I, I think is happening is that in the last 100, 200 years, we have applied economic across 
the board of all of these layers. Before, these layers have their own logic, and now they're kind of sort of merged into what we're applying into, in, into capitalism. Right? So our economic paradigm um, com commercializes everything nowadays, from the Amazon forest all the way to animals. Right? So uh, my question is, is this, is this how we want to continue to our, with our future? And you know, what I really want to know is, how can we, moving forward, how can we provide for the growing population without over-consuming these resources. So one of the things that I, I have done continuously is, uh, I don't have a slide for this, but um, to use the, the, the um, carbon footprint calculator. How many of you guys have done that? Uh, quite a few. Uh, so I, I, I try to be super, con uh, super conscious about um, uh, being a responsible consumer. And Every single time I've done it, I've never been able to manage to do uh, less than one. So for those who have never used it, so you can use this calculator to calculate your carbon footprint, and it will tell you if every single person in this world consume like you, how many worlds or Earths you need to sustain our consumer behavior. And me being conscious, the answer has always been around four. It needs four Earths for me for, for our world to be able to sustain. And for me, that's very problematic. And I, I, would, I would invite all of you guys to, to just Google how to, you know, uh, uh, finding this um, carbon um, calculator and see what is your footprint and see how you can change that. Moving on, one of the things that, one of the uh, questions that I'm, I'm trying to answer is uh, this growing population. And the first thing that we looked at is what we're calling transaction friction. So transaction friction is millions and trillions of dollars that we spend on materials and energy that don't give us any value. So specifically, we're actually talking about the extra costs of a good uh, or services that is in addition to the good itself. So um, you probably think that this is what, 10% of the, the, the spending in every single purchase that you make, maybe 20%. So let, let's take a look. Um, this is an example of a craft beer. So in this particular example, 57% is dedicated to transaction costs. And specifically, I'm talking about shipping and distribution. Let's take another example. This is in developing country where um, information, um, uh, logistics and information are far less efficient. The transaction fr uh, friction cost here is more than 80%. Um, so we're highly ineffective, and it doesn't only affect the, the how much we spend on the good. It also, um, it's also very costly to company. It's very costly to environment. Here in the statistics, is showing that one-third of the container is moved emptied every single day. And that increases the, uh, the, the use of CO2 unnecessarily. Uh, and that happens across the board in every single industry. It also trickle down, trickles down to the cons on the consumer level. It wastes our time. It wastes money. And across the board, it's just a very inefficient uh, way of um, handling our markets. So in the next couple of slides, I want to talk about the evolution of commerce. So let's talk about the history of commerce. We start. Um, you know, we go to stores, we buy things, uh, we exchange with money, and that's, you know, what we know of traditional commerce today. And then what happened is that internet came along, and you have e-commerce, right? Which is great, because all of a sudden, e-commerce is al allowing us to buy things. Uh, you don't need to go to the store, you can buy it whenever you want, uh, and it changes the way we transact. And a lot of different companies spouted out from that, um, from that bubble. And then we had M-commerce, mobile commerce. And mobile commerce uh, uh, allowed for a very different set of environment for people to exchange. All of a sudden, it's location-based, right? So Uber, Airbnb use a lot of the M-commerce capability to be able to transact on the spot and in real time. So what will happen next in the future? You guys already know because it's in the topic of my talk. <laughs> so it's autonomous. We're postulating this future of the autonomous uh, commerce, right? And so for us, autonomous commerce sits in this new uh, machine economy era, what we're calling m to m where intelligent, autonomous, networked uh, machines exchange with each, with each other capable of making transactions um, as autonomous market participants. 
and with very little interventions uh, from humans. And that is a world that is going to be happened very soon. Now, uh, we're foreseeing this future because of what is happening today. There is access, more and more access to data, there's more access to computer power, um, the advancement of AI, and the, uh, all of the growth of, in IoT devices. All of this is leading to, towards this, this very probable future of the autonomous um, commerce. So let me give you a couple of examples. These are very, very simple examples that, um, that might happen in the future. So imagine if I have uh, an, an autonomous vehicle and this gentleman here also have an autonomous vehicle. We're in the highway together. Maybe we will, our vehicle will transact uh, with each other so that I will pay your car for a reasonable fee to move over and I can move faster. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> Another example would be in food. Um, you know, I might have a smart wallet. I go into a smart supermarket, and my wallet might negotiate with a smart supermarket on the spot in real time for per perishable for discount for perishable items. Right. So these are some kind of small examples of how autonomous commerce might happen. So just as it happened in e-commerce and m-commerce. All of these things are going to be disrupted, will be changed, right? So from payments, buyer, seller, supply, demand, market distribution, all of these things will be changed. But how are they going to be changed? So let's take a look. You guys have seen these bots. Yes, robots from the, the fulfillment center at Amazon. And they, they move around. What, what, what don't you see are people in the background, right? In the future, these bots might also become delivery bots uh, coming to your home. Right? You might not even need a fulfillment centers or storage centers. These goods are constantly in fluidity in, in, in our city delivering these goods to you. Amazon is already working on particip particip ah, participatory shipping uh, where they will send stuff to you before you even ask. So these bots will be uh, always on the streets uh, coming to you. So on the other spectrum, some of these places are rolling out cashierless supermarkets um, so that they can remove the, the, the transaction interactions between you know, cashiers and, and payments. And you know, maybe in the future, that the whole entire city will become uh, our supermarkets. There's, there won't be walls, there won't be contained, and we will always constantly be pushed in the, um, in the products that people want to sell us. And this, we're not actually very far from this, this future. And there are already startups um, working on how to merge all of these different uh, players together to create a level of convenience in our transaction. As an architect, I'm always interested in, um, as an architect, trained architect, a long, long time ago, even though I don't practice, I'm always interested in how this will affect the space. So I was looking at you know, um, what this might, how this will interact with us in the future. And we thought of this possible future of what we're calling transaction membrane. So uh, just as our refrigerator and our ovens, you, you have access to it, maybe in the future, these appliances might have multiple uh, openings, one to interior, inter interior, interior to your house and the other one that is exterior to your house where they can deliver your groceries, where can, they can deliver your, your takeouts, uh, maybe even your closets and your pantries and all of these things will have access to the exterior place where you can transact, make those transactions. Um, so, some of these things might happen in the future. They might not. These are all postulations that we're, we're um, thinking of. Um, I also wanted to look at how the transitions of commerce had happened in the past. So if we look at digital goods, for example, music, uh, and I think music was an industry, a good comparison in, in, in the sense that it, it had, we have seen the, the um, transition happen in, you know, in the last 10, 15 years. So, we would go to the store, for example, and buy records. Oh, well, maybe not records, CDs. <laughs> um, and then what happened was e-commerce, uh, which means that we can go online on platforms like iTunes and buy, and buy maybe a single song. Whereas in the store, we had to buy the whole entire CD, um, and you have to buy the whole entire songs, uh, the whole entire package of 10 songs. Um, and then M-commerce came about. You have Spotify, where it became a subscription base, where now all of a sudden, with a monthly uh, fee, you have access to hundreds and millions and thousands of songs out there in the world. Well, what might that look like in the autonomous commerce? How would that, what, what business model will, will that uh, translate into, into the future? Well, 
um, Alexa is already working on deep music, where there's purely AI-generated music that is to your preferences. Um, and so looking at this trajectory, I asked myself, well, what does that look like in food? Right? So music is a digital product. Food obviously is not, but uh, food is following that trajectory, and I wanted to map out what that potential looks like. So um, obviously, we still have our market. We still go to the market and buy food. Um, and now, more and more, you, we see a surge of e-commerce and, um, and online supermarkets where you can buy things, right? Well, what's going to happen next? Is there such a thing as Spotify for food in the future where you push, where they would be pushing recommendations onto you as to what you should buy? And, and yet, what will happen next? What will AI-generated food uh, in the future looks like? And this is some of the things that we looked at and we played with. So in the next segment, I want to, I want to, I want to ask you guys a few questions about breakfast that you guys had today. How many of you guys had breakfast? Everybody. OK, good. So keep your hands up as I'm asking these questions. So a lot of people have breakfast. Next question I want to know is, do you guys know how much your breakfast cost? OK, a lot of people still know what their breakfast costs. OK, so the next question is, how many of you guys who had breakfast know how much it costs, know the nutritional value of the breakfast you ate? So was it organic? Uh, did it come from? Yeah, there's quite a number of people still. OK, good, good, good. So the next question is, do you know where your breakfast came from? That it came from, sourced from a local farm? No. Oh, there's one. There's still one person's hands up. OK, good. We still have two more questions. Where is this? Where is this person? OK, good. So I'm asking you, do you know the carbon footprint of the food that you ate? No, we just lost the last guy. Oh, and I have one more question. Oh, you do, <laughs> kind of, sort of. The okay, last question is, do you know the social implications of that food that you ate? Take a look around you. There's no one with their hands up, not a single person. Let me ask one last question. How many of you guys would like to know all of the answers of the questions that I've just asked? Most people. Now. Um, I'm going to go through these questions. OK, so it bothers me that we do this three times a day, 365 times a year, 365 days a year, and over the population of the globe, which is 7.7 .7 billion people. We're talking about 8.43 trillions of unknowns that we do every single year across the whole entire world. And these are things that these are decisions that will affect us as individuals. Th these are decisions that will affect our planet. And yet we we do this almost like a routine at the most convenient decisions that is made. So my question is: imagine the level of impact this could have if it is driven by knowing, by understanding the mechanism and our food system behind. So right now we're we're living in this post mass production era where efficiency and convenience have been the priority. And we need to start incorporating some of our other values, like social goals, our health, our environment, uh, our environmental impact, alongside economic ones. Now, transactions need to be beyond convenience, in my opinion, um, and it needs to hold the value that we're all, uh, that is important to us. <clears throat> So my question also to you guys is, do we have to choose between convenience and values? Can we have both? So in this coming age of autonomous commerce, um, we have two choices. One, we can continue the way li as life as usual. Um, and we can you know, allow a, lo a lot of these algorithms, these big tech, to continue to push consumerism uh, even further and breaching privacy along the way. Um, and this is already happening, right? Alexa, Google Home, all of these are in the near future will become these autonomous commerce agents that will be driving uh, consumerism to us. Or we can take the other road where we can choose to incorporate our values into our e economics and in out into our economy and using these autonomous agents for good in a decentralized way to optimize economic, ecological, and social goals 
as individuals and as um, collective. We can choose. The idea is that when we start talking about economy and ecology as the same domain, maybe we can truly understand how we can move forward. Um, so before I talked about the fact that for the first time in human history, we people have more innovation power than, com than companies and uh, uh, nation states. I think that in the coming age of autonomous commerce, we might even have more innovation power as individuals. Um, and I think as companies, there are things that we can do, right? Uh, we can't just ignore uh, these other non-economic values that we start, to, we need to start incorporating the social goods, the environmental impact into our economic equations so that uh, we can work towards a more equilibrated uh, status. As governments, we need to start understanding how to drive alignment on the local and global um, scale. We can't be myopic uh, and only lo look at localized solutions, nor can we be paralyzed at these global challenges. And I think that these autonomous agents in the future could help us mediate uh, uh, and uh, make the alignment between these two spectrums. And lastly, I think as individuals, um, we can't continue to be mindless and needless in our spending and in our consumption. And uh, uh, I think that we can choose to having these autonomous agents to work for us to understand our value and understand our goal um, and to apply those goals into a greater, larger collective objective. So I'm a maker. Um, and, but it doesn't really matter if I'm making you know, hardware or websites or businesses or even futures. But what really does matter is that everything I make, um, it's because I want it to matter towards the end. And this is a quote that I love that I have always used and it resonates with what David Rowan said yesterday about um, bullshit innovation. You know, I don't want to spend my time creating, um, uh, what was it? It was a cat uh, poop notification smart device. I don't want to spend my time doing this. I don't think any one of us should be spending our time doing this. Um, really, that our greatest fear should not be of failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. So we are here to celebrate, what, 20 years of Internet Dalgona. Um, I'm going to be bold. I'm, I would like to be invited back 20 years from now. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about the things that we have succeeded in doing. And I want to talk about how we have managed to change the world. Um, and I hope that 20 years from now, I can come back and talk about all, all of the things that we have as a collective managed to uh, achieve. So one last thing that I want to mention before we wrap up, this particular project, Autonomous Commerce, has, hasn't, I haven't been working it by myself. Uh, Mark Binger, who's my partner, who's right over there, uh, deserves uh, you know, applause for all of his work, um, as well as the team at Alpha. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you so much for listening. Um, talk? Talk? Yes? <laughs> Thank you so much, Cecilia. Thank and um, let me just ask a few questions. Is that okay? Uh, yes. <laughs> I was um, seeing, that you were here for Harper's talk, right? Yes. So I saw that picture of those uh, robots, those Amazon bots in the street. And my first thought was, are they coming to kill me? <laughs> now, Probably. Yeah, because if we are going to have this many autonomous vehicles in the streets, delivery bots that are just continuously moving around, robots hitching rides with other robots. How much of this do you think our current system can sustain? Because, okay, so machines make it easier to plan these things, but if planning also comes at no environmental cost, if you can just have machines running around because it's so cheap and they run on cheap batteries, on cheap power, what's the What's the impact on like society when you have so much machines? Machines everywhere for everything. Drones flying through the air, bots delivering other bots. Have you, have you considered like what's, what's a good sustainable, do you think we'll have to have a tax on robots for instance? 
Oh, 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 that's a Many really, questions in really one, good yeah, question. Yeah. We, we, that's, that's the next step. Okay. Um, um, <laughs> I'm saying that because uh, in the very first slide, when I talk about autonomous commerce, on the bottom it says when robot gets rights, right? So right. When, when you put the responsibility, just as we created the entity of a, a corporate, uh, and a corporate has its own um, I, um, entity, has its own legal rights, while robots will be, we're going to question how robots will also have those rights. Yeah. And so so when you give money to these robots, how are they, are they, will they be able to vote, for example? Are they, will you be able to give them a passport, for example? All of these questions are going to be, uh, ar you know, arising uh, coming out of this autonomous commerce age. I don't, we don't have the answer, but I do want to say that uh, as an architect as well, we talked briefly about how maybe there might be another layer of infrastructure that we will build in, mm. in future cities, right? Maybe in the future, um, instead of sewages, we might have you know, uh, tunnels where these bots will be in yes. always yes. in constant. Bot sewers. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Instead of rats underground, it's Who full knows? of bots. Elevators might be, mini elevators might be made so that they can be have uh, vertical uh, mobility. Th those might be built in in the future, and it's very probable. And it's not very... Uh, far from historically, we had these chutes where you throw away trash right. from, you know, uh, or oh. elevate dumb waiters for right. uh, food exactly. going up. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So. so you were very surprised, I think, to see that so many people here had used a sewing machine. But in yes. Sweden, uh, sewing is actually mandatory in school. Wow. Sewing and woodworking is <laughs> mandatory. That's awesome. So everybody has to learn <laughs> to use a sewing been machine. I should Swedish. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, a subject called slade, which is basically shop. So it switches between woodwork and sewing and every student has to take both and then sometimes you also get to choose one that or the other. That is awesome. So as a maker, your opening to the making world was obviously the sewing machine. Uh, I know that this subject in Swedish schools, shop class, is constantly under fire because you were also talking about are we teaching our kids outdated uh, techniques or mm -hmm. things that don't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And all the detractors are saying that, why are we teaching kids how to work with wood? How are we teaching kids, why are we teaching kids how to sew when they should be learning how to code or mm -hmm. decode algorithms? Mm -hmm. what's, what's your response to that? I don't think that there's one thing uh, that you have to teach the kids. In the future of education, I think it's very much about skills and a set of skills. Uh, they're going to have to learn how to code, and not specifically about coding. Coding provides for a mechanism for us to understand uh, uh, problem solving. Um, and so making, for example, allowed me to increase my confidence. Every one of these skills will provide a, a little extra value to our knowledge schema, right? So um, in the future, it's not a, about one diploma. It's not about, um, and I'm, I'm going to share an anecdote with you guys. Um, I have, um, I have um, I'm a fangirl of Google X. And I once read um, Esther Teller uh, article on Wired about how they do their hiring in Google X. And he said something that stuck into my head. He said something about experts. He said, experts know a lot about nothing. Hmm. <laughs> so they know, they know, have a lot of deep um, expertise knowledge in one single topic, but they don't really understand a broader kind of spectrum of, of understanding of the world. And what he was saying is that uh, what they hi when they hired in Google X, what they do is they look for you know, people that have a more T profile, uh, a more broad expertise, but also understand uh, one particular subject. And what they're really looking for are, are ability to synthesize between these um, information points, these nodes. And in the future, these skill sets will provide for these different nodes for people to be able to synthesize uh, their own um, educational framework. Um, and that's, that's how I see education in the future. So like having shop or sewing, it could be, I mean, I see it as an integral part of Absolutely. being a well-rounded human being. Yes. But uh, so including coding or algorithms or whatever, it wouldn't necessarily come at the cost of the other. Exactly. It's yeah. not, it doesn't cancel each other. No. So yes, we're, if we're talking about skills here, they would have to be developed in a whole new way. Um, I also got the impression from your talk that the way we're talking about transactions, the, the word transaction, the concept itself must perhaps be enlarged yes. into including whole new ideas of right. what that might be, right. especially if we have entirely new skill sets as well. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you gave a few examples, but if you could dream up your absolute best future scenario of automated commerce um, or, or autonomous commerce, what would you imagine as <laughs> transactions in the future then? 
I, we worked on this uh, scenario. So very often at work, we do speculative futures. So we, we create a kind of future world um, where we, we imagine how, what this desirable context might look like. Mm -hmm. And so one of, in one of those exercises, we came up with this idea of what we're calling fluid consumption. So what happens if the goods are always on the go? Not just goods, but uh, imagine in this transaction membrane that I talked about earlier, not just goods, but things that you can lend. So like uh, your sewing machine uh, that you're not using all the time, your, your drills and whatnot are always constantly on in fluidity in the city, all, as well as maybe trash. Uh, and even recycling um, objects that you want to recycle, and you have this mechanism to transact autonomously so that if you need the sewing machine, it will be near your place, but when I need it, it will be near mine. It takes out all of the frictions that is needed for those transactions to happen. In that world where you're completely fluid in understanding our needs and our preferences and our desires and our values, can we create an optimization where these uh, frictions are removed? And so that was one of the projections that we have. The thing with what we do is that we, we very often than not, we create multiple future scenarios. We don't think that there's only one instance of future, um, but we built around um, possibilities of how, how those things can happen, and we reverse engineer to see how, how we can build the roadmap for it. So you had a little exercise where you had us raise our hands to discuss our breakfast. Yes. And I get the idea that there's all these choices that we have to make or all this information that we could have regarding every choice, every transaction. Now, how much information do you think a consumer can handle versus how much information does a consumer want to handle? Because you were saying, don't you want the information and all this? And I was like, no, <laughs> there's already too many choices and too much right. information in my life. Right. So I would be very happy to let a computer handle that for me, which I guess was the Absolutely. point of what you were saying. Right. If I could enter my preferences right. and say, I want organic food, right. I want, but then what happens when the robot brings me my breakfast and it's like, that was a thousand dollars. That's so. <laughs> there's there's another happen. parameter, right? It might happen. Um, and so I'm I'm gonna share with um, share another project that we did. Uh, we called it Time uh, Time Magazine 2049. So we do a lot of speculative designs uh, in, in our work. And what we did was we took a Time magazine of this year in February, but we added uh, 30 years onto the date. And we create all of the content, again, on the articles inside based on uh, the machine economy in 2049. Mm. So one of the articles that came uh, out with this was like, uh, looking at the negative consequences, very much of you know, what Harper talked about this morning. And it said, and the article said, and we had everyone in the office wrote an article, and this particular person decided to write, well, what, hap what happens when these agents miscalculated or decided you know, uh, some of these values that are in conflict with each other, and they decide one is have higher priority. So the, the outcome was um, it was a uh, fast food restaurant sourcing meat um, that could perhaps come from homeless people. Right. Nice. And yes. so that brought up a lot of questions and said, yes, well, how do we mi mitigate that? We might not have the answers for now, but we're definitely a uh, asking those questions of what happens when things go wrong. Yeah. I'm wondering, because um, you also mentioned that we should uh, perhaps thinking about, we should think about how we can incorporate our social goals into our economic goals, right, to, to make them compatible or to make them the same. I'm wondering, um, because so many companies or organizations today, we're all under pressure to measure. We need to measure success, and mm -hmm. then usually this comes down to numbers that mm -hmm. we can translate into economic uh, value, mm -hmm. so to speak. How can we translate social value into economic value? That is the question of the year. <laughs> and in this project we've been working on, we're, we're trying to find a quantifiable way to understand or to measure the, the, the results of, you know, you know, how can we put a number in, uh, uh, let's say, a factory that use uh, fair um, employment laws versus one that isn't. You, you know, how do you put a number on that? Um, this is something that we're working on to understand. Uh, by far not easy. Uh, the other thing is that there already exists a lot of index uh, in the world. Um, they're not consolidated by any means, but they're definitely a start to understand how, um, how this index can work together. And I think it's a question of, um, it's a question of, of working together. It's a question of pulling all the, uh, all the stakeholders to understand how, uh, as an ec 
ecosystem, how they can understand these metrics and indexes, um, but as a acceptable uh, currency uh, that is beyond economic uh, uh, value. And I, I do have to say, you know, 100, 100, 200 years ago, money was also a mess. Currency mm -hmm. was a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not a question that we can't arrive to it. It's, you know, when can we arrive to that point and who's going to be responsible of that? Mm -hmm. uh, but I do, real, I do um, think that in the not so far future, we will create as a global um, acceptable unit, this new index that will incorporate all of these different uh, parameters that is just beyond just money and transaction mm -hmm. uh, currencies. Value not in dollars but yes. in something else. Yeah. Thank you so much, Cecilia thank Tam, you. for your interesting talk yes. and thank you for coming to Internet Dog. Round you. of applause. <laughs>